This all took place back in November of last year. I booked a trip to propose to my then-girlfriend, flew us both out to Florida so we could go to Disney World, caught the last concert of one of our favorite bands, and of course, proposed. We had a blast. I proposed at the Disney castle, she said yes, and everything went well. We took off to go home the next morning. It was Thanksgiving Day, and we were connecting in San Francisco. About 30 minutes into the flight, though, the captain came on the intercom to announce that one of the engines wasn't depressurizing properly. We had to loop back to the terminal to wait for another plane. When we got there, my fiancé switched her phone back from airplane mode, and within a minute, she had over 10 voicemails, all from the same number, which she didn't know. Fearing the worst, we called the number back without listening to any of the voicemails. I knew something was wrong right away. As soon as she started talking to them, her face went blank and she stopped speaking. I told her to give me the phone so I could ask who it was. The voice I heard on the other end sounded dead, absolutely no hint of emotion. All he said was, I will kill you both as soon as you land in Seattle. I asked again who it was, but he just hung up. My fiancé had no idea who it was, and I certainly didn't recognize the voice. I called him back, and he just repeated the time we were landing. Little did he know, we were delayed by hours. I used to work in telecom, so I was able to pull some strings and get the name and address associated with the phone number. Neither of us recognized the name or the address, so my fiancé looked him up on Facebook. She found that she had one mutual friend with him, her ex-best friend, Karen. I guess Karen got involved in heavy drug usage a while back and started stealing from my fiancé, which led to the end of their friendship. We did some more digging and found out that the caller was the boyfriend of Karen's new best friend. Right away, I assumed Karen must have seen all the posts on social media about our trip and the new engagement, and she just wanted to piss on our parade. Even still, I didn't take it as a joke. A death threat is a death threat, and you can't underestimate these kinds of things when they're coming from meth heads. They could easily follow through on something like this just on a whim. I decided to call him back, and just ended up talking firmly over his rambling, telling him that I was armed, I knew where he lived, and I wasn't afraid to take things into my own hands. When he hung up on me, I immediately called the Seattle area law enforcement to report the incident. They asked me to call back on a non-holiday, so I called the emergency line, and they told me the same thing. They were useless. We were on our own. We ended up arriving close to nine hours after our original ETA. Once we landed, we saw that we both had one voicemail each. I assumed hers was from this guy, but I had no idea who mine could be from since he didn't have my number. I was relieved when I saw that the voicemail was from my dad, but felt a bit panicked when I listened back to it. Apparently, he got a call from my neighbors saying that my mailbox had been destroyed, possibly hit by a car, and all the mail was stolen from it. Her voicemail, however, was this guy screaming at the top of his lungs, demanding to know where she was, and making even more outlandish threats. I ended up driving my fiancé back to her place, insisting that she shouldn't come home with me just in case someone was still there. When I got home, I found a brick that had been thrown through my window with an old picture of my fiancé and Karen taped to it. I tried calling the guy from my phone, but there was no answer. After covering the window with a tarp and checking in with my fiancé, I decided to finally go to bed. I filed a police report the next day, but they said they couldn't really do anything if I never actually saw the guy on my property. Again, useless. We blocked everyone involved on social media and then tried to move on with our lives. Three weeks went by before I heard from him again. He texted me a picture of my fiancé at work. I immediately called her and told her to go to the back of the bubble tea shop she worked in, then called mall security to explain the situation. Unfortunately, by the time they got to the food court, the guy was gone. I was done messing around at this point. I knew his address, so I stopped by to leave him a little message. I taped a note to his front door that said, This is your last chance to leave her alone. This is your only warning. I taped a bullet on it from my gun. 
We haven't heard a word from him since. To this day, I'm still baffled by this experience. I was living in Austin, Texas at the time, but I had flown out to Los Angeles for the weekend. My friends put on a small yearly music festival at a biker bar out near Joshua Tree, where most of the attendees are also musicians and usually know each other. So we drink, heavily, for three days or so. By the end of it, I usually need at least a week to recover. So I was flying back to Texas, wildly hungover and miserable and completely drained. I had a flight from LA to Dallas, then a quick hop to Austin from there. I was seated by the window on the left side, where there were only two seats. Seated in the aisle seat next to me was a middle-aged woman who seemed completely normal, just her average Texan mom. We made polite small talk for a few minutes, but I really needed some rest, so shortly after takeoff, I put on my headphones and started watching a movie on my iPod until I fell asleep. Throughout the movie, I was vaguely aware of her trying to look over my shoulder to see what I was watching, and I thought I heard her say something like, Oh great, just ignore me. This happened several times, but I convinced myself I was mishearing her and just continued drifting off. Eventually, I noticed her furiously scribbling in the margins of a beat-up, leather-bound book. I peeked over at it and saw that the entire book was filled with unintelligible chicken scratch, taking up every bit of available space in the margins. Looking closer, I saw that it was an Alcoholics Anonymous book. I figured this lady must just have some issues, so I decided to mind my own business and eventually fell asleep. I woke up as we were landing in Dallas. People were starting to get off the plane, but this lady made zero effort to start gathering her things. She just kept sitting there, scribbling in her book. Again, I'm wildly hungover and kind of cranky, and I had no patience for anything that was going to prolong my time on this airplane. It was our turn to leave, but she didn't move into the aisle. The rows behind us then continued past her to leave. Finally, I said to her, Hey, I've got a connection to catch, so I've got to get moving here, gesturing towards the aisle and standing up. She laughed, shook her head, and said, Oh no, you're not going anywhere. I was so confused. Of course, my mind was not at its sharpest that day, but I was just concentrated on leaving. I responded, I assure you, I am going somewhere. I'm getting off of this plane now. She shook her head and started saying that, I promised I would never leave her. At this point, other people who were leaving the plane were watching our exchange, also baffled. I made eye contact with a few people to indicate that I was just as thrown off as they were, and then edged my way past this woman out of our row. As I shoved past, she sighed and said, Well, I guess I have to go with you then. At which point she stood up behind me, leaving her purse and book, and all other belongings on the seat. All down the tunnel, through the terminal, and up the escalator, she followed close behind me, grinning like a madwoman the entire time. I picked up my pace, but she continued right on my heels. I did not want to deal with whatever breakdown this woman was having in the state I was in, so I tried ignoring her for a while. Eventually, I got up to the waiting area for the monorail to the terminal where my connecting flight was, and she slid up right next to me, still grinning. Finally, I turned to her and said, All right, seriously, why are you following me like this? Her response this time was, Because I love you, and you promised me you would never be apart from me. I laughed nervously and looked around while loudly announcing that I did not promise that, and that I had no idea who she was. When the train arrived, I got on, and she obviously followed, now trying to hold my hand. I moved around the monorail car, texting my girlfriend at the time about what was happening, telling her I was actually kind of terrified by this woman. My phone battery was at 1% though, and died before I could get a response. I was getting seriously creeped out by this woman. Her eyes were completely vacant. There was nothing but emptiness in her stare. She didn't even seem to blink. Coupled with her unyielding grin, I was sure it would only be a matter of time before she snapped and proceeded to stab me or shove me down the escalator or something. She was still grabbing at my hand and following me as I shoved my way around the tiny train car, trying to get some distance between us. 
I started to loudly announce to the other passengers that I had no idea who this woman was, asking someone to try to get a hold of security. Everyone responded with silence. Apparently, no one else wanted to deal with her either. At this point, I started to feel like I might be crazy too, making random statements to a train full of strangers. We finally got to the other terminal, so I hurried to my gate with her still right behind me, continuing to ramble about how I wasn't going to get away from her. When I got to my gate, I spent a moment scanning the crowd, looking for someone who might be able to help. Finally, I spotted a woman wearing what looked to be a police uniform. I approached her and started explaining the situation, but she just shook her head at me when I asked if she was security. It seemed like everyone in the crowd was just doing their best to ignore us. You'd be amazed at how hard it was to find police or security in a damn airport these days when you really need them. Finally, I went up to the desk and shamelessly interrupted the agent standing there. Doing my best to maintain composure, I put on a half smile and explained to them that I had no idea who this woman was and that she had been following me all day. Both of the agents laughed. The male agent made a comment like, Oh, long vacation, huh? The lady laughed along with the agents, rolling her eyes at my absurd assertion that I didn't know her. I chuckled, but shook my head and said again, No, I mean it. I have no idea who this woman is. I think they finally saw the desperation in my eyes, or sensed the seriousness of my tone because their smiles immediately faded. He awkwardly asked us for our boarding passes, so I handed him mine, and she produced hers from her pocket as I continued explaining. She was on my previous flight. She even left her purse on the plane, all the way in the other terminal. The agents talked among themselves off to the side for a moment while I did my best to completely ignore this woman, swatting her hand away as she tried to hold mine for the hundredth time. The agents made a few quick, hushed calls, and then came back over to us to usher me away from my stalker. They immediately whisked me through the door and slammed it before she could sneak in, and I was loaded onto the plane about ten minutes before the other passengers as a stream of staff came by offering their apologies. Eventually, the rest of the passengers got on, all shooting me sympathetic or confused glances. The man who sat behind me actually leaned forward to ask me what happened. I gave him the brief version, and he told me that she had a complete and total meltdown the second I got on the plane. She was screaming, tearing her hair out, pounding her feet. Apparently, they had to take her away in handcuffs. To this day, I still wonder all the time what the hell was going on with that woman. I've barely told the story to my friends because it's just so unbelievable. I never received any other information about the incident, never learned who she was, or figured out why she latched onto me like that. My skin still crawls when I think about the look in her eyes when she told me I had promised to never leave her. This encounter took place about 10 years ago in a Milwaukee, Wisconsin airport. I was 19, independent, and discovering my identity. I had developed a relationship with a girl from North Carolina who I had met on MySpace. I was infatuated. We were constantly talking online, video chatting, texting, and calling each other for six months until we finally made plans to meet in person. She came to visit and it was perfection, and I was obsessed. We're still together to this day. Everything was great until it came time for her to fly back to North Carolina. I knew she had a flight to catch, but I was trying to enjoy every last moment with her, and I wasn't sure when I would be able to see her again, so I was dragging my feet a bit. The bus trip to the airport took longer than we had anticipated, so by the time we reached the airport, it was only five minutes before her boarding time. We ran to luggage check, only to be told she had missed her flight. A small part of me was secretly happy, but I did feel a bit guilty and wasn't sure how to help since I didn't have a car or enough money to help her get on another flight. Luckily, the woman at the luggage counter was able to find her a seat on a flight eight hours later. There wasn't an easy way to get back to my place in the meantime, though, so we looked for a spot in the airport to post up for a few hours. She had her laptop and some blankets and pillows to keep her comfortable during her flight, so I was actually looking forward to spending some relaxing extra time together. 
As we looked around for a spot to sit down and stretch for a while, I called my roommate and asked if she could come by with some food and my wallet that I had left at home. Finally, we found an empty family room, complete with chairs, a love seat, and plenty of wall outlets. There was also a large bathroom, but the door was closed when we walked in. The airport was pretty desolate overall, and there was no one waiting to use the room, so we decided to make ourselves comfortable. My roommate arrived shortly after with snacks and drinks, and decided to wait with us so she could give me a ride home after. The three of us sat in the secluded room watching movies, my roommate mostly on the phone with her girlfriend. Eventually, sometime during our second movie, we were startled by the sound of a door opening, except it wasn't the door we had came in through, which was closed the whole time. It was the bathroom door. A man came out and sat directly across from us. He must have been in the bathroom the entire time we were there. None of us had even bothered to check. The light was on, but it was completely silent inside. The man was average height and a bit overweight. Dark hair, olive skin. His hair was wet and he was holding a towel, running it over his head to scrub his hair dry, as if he had just gotten out of the shower. To make the situation weirder, he was barefoot and didn't have any luggage with him. He was wearing khaki cargo shorts, a white undershirt, and an unbuttoned Hawaiian print shirt. He just sat there casually, as if he hadn't been in the bathroom making absolutely no noise for over two hours. Eventually, he broke the tension in the room by asking us where we were flying to. We answered as casually as possible, not giving any specific information about ourselves. When we asked him where he was heading, he responded, Oh, wherever the wind takes me. I knew he had been vague, but he was just straight up avoiding our questions. I tried asking him where he was from, and he said, Oh, nowhere. I have no home country. I was confused, to say the least, so I asked if he was local to the area. No, no, I'm from nowhere. I just go wherever. I started to think he might be homeless and was just using the bathroom to clean up. No big deal. He would wander off eventually, right? My roommate got up at that point to go find better cell reception, intentionally leaving the door to the family room wide open as she left. I could see a few people walking around now and started to feel a little better. The door was open, and this guy could walk out whenever he wanted, and at least people could see us now. My roommate wandered back a few minutes later, and we hunkered down for another movie. The man started to doze off, so we did our best to just ignore him, making sure the door remained open so other people in the airport could see us. Sometime during one of the many movies we were watching, we made a crucial mistake. We got bored and sleepy and ended up falling asleep. Stupid, incredibly stupid, but of course, we didn't even realize we let our guard down until we woke up. What we woke up to is forever ingrained in my memory. There was a hard banging on the door, and we could hear police officers shouting on the other side, something about opening the door and walking out with our hands up. My eyes immediately darted to the door, trying to figure out why they didn't just open it themselves. There was no lock after all. Then I saw it. At the bottom, maybe three or four industrial box cutters were shoved underneath, wedged in to keep the door from opening. My mind was reeling. What the fuck was going on? Why would he lock himself in here with us? How could we all have fallen asleep? The man started talking to the officers outside. Okay, okay, no problem. I'll open the door. Hang on just a minute. He walked over to the door, pulling the box cutters out and sliding their blades back into their hulls before placing them in the pocket of his cargo shorts. He opened the door and the police immediately handcuffed him and escorted him away. All the while, he was trying to explain that he just wanted some privacy and didn't mean us any harm. Sure, dude, you needed to shove box cutters under the door for privacy while you're in a secluded room with three 19-year-old girls? Right. The police asked us if we were okay and explained that they had been looking for him. Apparently, he had a habit of coming to that airport and hiding out, harassing people, and just generally being a nuisance. We assured the police that we were okay, just rattled by the whole situation. In the end, we never did find out where he was from, or where he was going, and most importantly, 
We never found out what he was planning on doing after trapping us in that room. <laughs>